Hi, this is Pastor Kevin with Journey of Faith Foursquare Christian Church. I just wanted to take a moment and thank you for logging on today to watch our video podcast as we explore God's Word and apply it to our lives. You know, it's so important for our walks that we spend time each day in God's Word to get to know Him and get to grow in Him. With all of my teachings, I have a sermon handout that is used during the message. It contains scriptures and fill-in-the-blank sections for you to follow along with. You may obtain this handout by logging onto our website that is listed on the screen. Go to our resources section and choose study materials. I hope and pray that God's word will speak to you today and thank you for joining the journey. For a couple of announcements. us on the sidewalk to keep us from going to Planned Parenthood, but she left within uh, three or four minutes. And then we had a guy, a couple guys driving by, and one of them was using some colorful language at us. But at the same time, we also had like a dozen or so different people that were honking and waving and saying, yeah, and they were cheering for us and supporting us, okay? Now, you guys, even though I'm the one that went, all of you guys helped on this event yesterday because... Because not only is it a way to provide awareness for that we are trying to protect lives, but it's also a way to raise money so the choices can stay, uh, so that they can stay, keep the doors open. And so our congregation, just by, and Roxy made an announcement last week, provided $160 for me to take a walk. So uh, I really appreciate that. Um, so after we got back from the walk, we had uh, a couple of uh, things that happened. Linda talked about how Choices is expanding. They are uh, increasing almost by double the amount of space that they have so that they can better serve the people. And many of the people that come through the doors of Choices are students from Cal Poly and from Mount Sac. So yesterday they had one couple that came up and talked. Maybe the picture's not up there. There was a couple that came up and talked holding their little baby. And this is a baby that was saved by choices. Because, and this little girl is now one years old. And this couple are both, they are both uh, uh, full-time students at Cal Poly. And she got pregnant and they weren't sure what to do. So they walked into the doors of choices and choices told them about the different options. They provided them with a free pregnancy test, a free uh, ultrasound. And then uh, after the baby was born, they came back and they took classes, they earned points. Uh, and, and so for free, uh, choices uh, donated to them because of the points that they earned. They got a car seat, they got clothes, they got a crib, uh, all these things, uh, the diapers, they got all these things for free because they went through these classes to learn how to, so she could take care of herself during a pregnancy and to teach them how to be parents. And so it was a wonderful day. I want to just thank you guys for sending me and helping our church to be a part of the Walk for Life. And I got a free t shirt. As I made the announcement last week, our shower for choices 
Um, so we can put our um, money where our mouth is, because we can say we support you, but then we don't support them when they really need it. And that is when they've chosen to keep their baby, and um, they have to buy diapers, two and three packs a week at, you know, eight, nine, ten dollars a pop. Um, the formula is twenty dollars a can. I mean, it's unbelievable, the cost. And so um, anything that you can give, there's a whole list on your invitation that you received last week, and if you didn't get your invitation, you have more. Um, and the nice thing about the shower, um, Debbie informed me, please don't wrap the gifts. It's so much easier for us not to unwrap them, and please don't take the price off of them, because we have to give a value for the tax benefit. So we are asking you not to wrap your gift and also not to take the price off of it because it'll help Debbie and I immensely. And um, if you want to go on in on a gift, um, Debbie, I believe, is going to take money and try to buy um, a stroller or a car seat or a crib. It all depends on how much money she receives. And um, you can do it that way. If you don't have time to shop and you want us to shop, we'll be happy to do it. There's all kinds of ways you can give. And uh, the shower is not just a shower, it's a yummy fellowship potluck. So we're all gonna have a potluck next week. We're gonna sit around and talk and have a wonderful time. So bring a dish that you wanna share. And some of the things you can get, and some of you go, well, I don't know, I don't have too much money. Big Lots has awesome things for low money. And the kids that choose to have their babies get points, and sometimes they don't get a lot of points, because if they miss classes and things like that, then they don't have a wallet full of points, as they call it. And so they, but they still want to go in and shop. It's just a benefit or a reward for going to classes. And things like, um, little towel kits like this, thank heavens for little girls, and thank heavens for little boys, and um, diapers and gift cards are wonderful, because then they can get what they, if they need to put a gift card toward, um, Formula, which is awesome, that is so awesome because that's what they use the gift cards for nine times out of ten is the formula that they need when they can't nurse. So anyway, that's our uh, infomercial for this week and um, we'll see you next week with food and presents in hand. One more. Wait, one more. We also have a garage sale coming up for Choices and that's on uh, Saturday, March 19th. So if you would like to go out to Chino Hills and buy something, you can. If you would like to clean out some stuff out of your house and donate it, you can bring it next week and I will uh, take it on and over for the garage sale. So let me know. Or you can drop it by the college where we live at, on Life Pacific College. You can contact me and you can drop it over there and I will take it. So thank you, guys. Thank you. Now I'm going to go ahead and pass this around. This is a sign-up for the potluck next week. And I don't know if I naturally, we've decided, because you know, we have such a good time when we have these products that every other month, every two months, we're going to have a potluck. And it's going to be the last Sunday of the month. But, I don't, know if it, if, I don't know if it was just me this year or not, but Easter really crept up on us. Because the last Sunday of this month would be Easter, and I'm sure that people have things to do. So we're going to have the potluck next week as the choices. And then you can uh, plan on having another potluck in May and July and all those things. But it's just a great opportunity just to hang out and have fellowship and, and a good time with us. And so, Easter is on March 27th. I hope that you'll join us. And please, um, please invite friends. I, I want to thank everybody that came to Ashley's memorial service last weekend. It was unbelievable. We had, there were at least, there were over 300 people in this room. We had chairs that went all the way, and we, we expanded chairs. The chairs went all the way back to the wall. There were people sitting in the room back there, and there were people standing in the foyer. And I just thought, you know, I could get used to this. And so invite your friends to Easter um, celebration. It's going to be a great time. The, the title of the sermon is Easter is not the, the end, it's just the beginning. And so, especially if you, if you have people that don't know Jesus, I, I encourage you to invite, invite a friend. Invite 10 friends. Invite how many friends? But um, we need them. And we're going to talk about it today with, with Peter. We need them to know about Jesus Christ. And so, um, so please invite them for that. This Sunday we have a women's prayer group at our house. So please uh, join us. Huh? This Saturday. Did I say Sunday? Oh, jeez. 
This Saturday, 8 o'clock, at our house, please uh, join us. We have youth group tonight at uh, our house at 5.30. And thanks to all the youth who went last week. Um, I think I told you we started a new ministry at Brookside, which is a retirement community up in, in San Diego, San Diego Verde. And uh, initially, the, there was kind of that awkwardness of who are these young whooper snappers and what are they doing here? And Jordan and Paul, um, Jordan and Matt, gosh. Good night, everybody. Have a good day. Um, Jordan and Matt um, started singing songs, but then they started singing the old hymns. And the, the people just came alive. And so they're throwing out all these songs. So uh, Matt and Jordan are going to be learning some new old hymns and some things. And so it ended up being really great. And so um, continue to play, pray for that ministry. It's really exciting. And, uh, and I think we're going to see a lot of good things happen because of that. And then also one last thing. And I keep saying this in the meeting. If you have not been able to join us on a Thursday night for a Bible study, I encourage you to do so. It was really, uh, this week we learned about, we always hear about the issue of separation in church and state. Church and state. And how, um, you know, we, we can't pray in school anymore. We can't bring our Bibles to school. We can't do all these things in, in public settings. You know, you can't put your Ten Commandments on the wall if you're a public uh, uh, employee because of separation of church and state. Well, we learned about the origin of that separation in church and state. And it actually had to do with the letter that the President... Um, Jefferson, Jefferson. I'm still 49. President Jefferson wrote, and he wrote it to a church. The church was asking, they, they, they wrote him a letter saying they were afraid that the government was going to become involved in church dealings. And so he wrote a letter back to them and guaranteed that there would be separation of church and state and that there would be a wall between church and state so that the state would never intervene in church activities, and we would all have our religious freedoms to practice our faith as we saw fit. Now, up until 1962, there had been challenges to that, and up until 1962, the, the, the Supreme Court had always used that letter, the letter, as justification for why we should have religious freedoms in America. Well, in 1962, the Supreme Court made a decision that banned prayer in public school, and instead of using the context of the letter, they used that one little phrase, separation of church and state. And from that point forward, it has been a domino effect of decisions and rulings that have continued to make it more and more difficult for us as Christians to express our faith in schools and work in other places. And it has completely twisted, and I mean twisted, the, the, the meaning and the tent, intent of President John, uh, Jefferson, who happened to be one of the signers of the original Declaration of Independence and, and Constitution. And so it's really fascinating, church, to, to read and learn this stuff. So I encourage you to come. And, and I share with everybody um, on, uh, on Thursday night, I read in the Tribune this week, the ACLU is going after the Azusa Unified School District right now because there's a teacher, I think it's at the high school level, who um, he, he has a picture of Jesus on his wall. And he runs a Bible study at the school. And so he's inviting kids to join them for the Bible study at school. And he's talking about Jesus and stuff. So now the ACLU is going to sue Azusa Unified School District to make this guy stop. So, so church, it's not getting any better. And that's why I really think this class is so important for us to remember. Because up until that point, I'll be honest with you, this is the, the gosh honest truth. Up until Thursday night, I always thought separation of church and state meant we were to separate the two. And why did I always think that? Because that's what we hear about in the press. And so I encourage you guys to come. Pastor Ruben's doing a great job. We, uh, we are, we're praying, and, and we all picked, uh, we, we picked countries or, or leaders or somebody to, to pray for. I've been praying for Vladimir Putin in Russia. And I read this week, and I didn't read the article, but the headline was that they, they put an atheist in Russia in prison for not believing in God. I'm like, wow, I thought the whole country didn't believe in God. But... But so, um, I, I encourage you guys to come. I encourage you to pray for other parts of this country, other leaders, other groups of individuals, because, um, because not only do they need a church, but as I'm learning more and more, we need it right here. So, uh, please join us for that. And um, Thursday night, we start at 7, we end exactly at 8.15, I can promise you that. Amen.
people hanging around and talking a little bit. But um, if you don't have a handout, please raise your hand and we will get you a handout. And if you don't have a Bible, a Bible, please raise your hand and we will get you a Bible. If you have your Bible, if you want to open up to Acts chapter 2, and we're looking at verses 22 through 36. And today's title is Encountering the Spirit and Proclaiming Jesus. Now, last week, if you remember, I told you about some very powerful sermons that had been preached in the Bible and the results of that. For example, I said Jonah preached to the city of Nineveh and the whole city was saved. And we know that Jesus had some very powerful messages and sermons and thousands of people came to, to follow him because of that. But when you think of the book of Acts, one of the things that we always think of are, are the, the, the fire and the, the miracles and the prophecy and the gifts and whatnot. But maybe you didn't realize that 25% of the book of Acts has to do with sermons or addresses that were given by Peter, Paul, and actually Stephen as well. So sometimes we get blindsided, we, we get tricked into not seeing the powerful messages that are in the book of Acts. And right now we've been looking at one of those powerful messages by Peter, who is transformed by the Holy Spirit, and in this message has the Holy Spirit speak through him. And remember I told you last week, Peter is not the greatest guy in the world. Peter denied Jesus three times. When they were questioning him and saying, hey, don't you know the man? The Bible says that he cursed at the people. And then just for fun, when they came to get Jesus out of the Garden of Gethsemane, he decided to cut off one of the soldiers' ears. So Peter is a lot like us. Because we deny Jesus. We maybe don't say the swear words, but we do curse at people. And we maybe have never cut off somebody's ear or arm. But how many of us, we're honest, we'd sure like to at times, right? So in Peter, we see a lot of us. But Jesus said to him in Matthew 16, 18, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, hell, shall not prevail against me. Through the power and the transformation of the Holy Spirit, Peter became the rock of the church. And in Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27, it says, I will give you a new heart, and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. See, church, that's what happens when we are transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. We are given a new heart and a new spirit. That heart of stone is taken away. Remember earlier I had said that, that we have to get rid of the veil off our heart. That stone is taken away and we are given a new heart and a new spirit. And we see throughout the Bible that the Spirit speaks through people. In the Old Testament, it was normally prophets that they would speak through. But in Jesus' day, the Spirit empowered God's people, like you and me, to be His vessel so that He could speak through us. And we see that in the scripture that we're going to be studying today. Peter, recognizing the power and the presence of of the Holy Spirit, through the fire and the, and the tongues and, and all that, stands up and chooses to speak a sermon to them. And he doesn't just speak any sermon, but he allows God to speak through him. And he chooses an Old Testament text about the outpouring of the Spirit of prophecy. And last week we read in after uh, Acts 2.17, And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God. So Peter was telling them, we are in the last days. And this is why you need to listen. The church here in my heart, we are in the last days. We just don't know when the last day is. We are in the last days. And as we were reminded last week with Ashley's service, the last day could be a lot sooner than you think. And so as Peter gets up to give this message, there's this sense of urgency within Peter that, that people need to know about Jesus. People need to be saved by Jesus. People need to be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And last week he quoted out of Joel 2 and it says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. 
And also on my main men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. He was reminding all the people in the crowd of what Joel had written a whole long time ago. And he was telling them that now was the time for salvation, just as Joel had spoken so long ago. So today we're going to see an amazing explosion of power as Peter experienced the Spirit and began to proclaim Jesus Christ. So Lord, we thank you for your word, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, just as, as the storms came last night and the rain came down, Lord, we thank you that those storms in our lives do pass. And we thank you for the sun and the blue skies, Lord, that follow them. Lord, I pray that our hearts would be open to hear your word today, Lord. Lord, I pray that our, our mind would be open to understand. Lord, pour your spirit out. Pour your spirit out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if you want to stand, we're going to go ahead and read. And I apologize that it's a, it's a little long. We're going to begin in verse 22, and we're going to go down to verse 36. And beginning in verse 22, it says, Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through, you, through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life, you will fill me with the joy of your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what has come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And you can go ahead and have a seat here. Now, this is really the main part. I know we started looking at Peter's sermon last week, but this is really the main part for the main body of this sermon. And what he's doing is he is defending and proclaiming who Jesus Christ is as the Lord and Messiah. And what's interesting, his sermon wasn't focused on, there are three points. His sermon wasn't focused on funny jokes or whatnot. His sermon wasn't even focused on great audio and visual. His sermon was, sermon was focused on one thing and one thing only. And he told them, if you, as you look at your life, if you're going to live a spirit-filled, empowered life, you must focus on one thing, Jesus. And church, the same thing goes for us. If we are to live the life that God wants for us, and if we're to live that spirit-filled, empowered life that He desires for us, then we must focus on one thing and one thing alone. And that's Jesus Christ. Now I know, I told you at the beginning of this year that we were going to be talking about the Holy Spirit the whole year. And I'm sure some of you are like, when are we going to get to this stuff? Like John Wimber said, when are we going to do this stuff? When are we going to start speaking in tongues? And when are we going to do all these things in church? Believe me, we are going to talk about the fruit. We are going to talk about the gifts of the Spirit. But I truly believe before we can get there, we must make sure that we are prepared and we understand what the Holy Spirit is about, who the Holy Spirit is, and how we receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And I tell you this, if we are to receive the power of the Holy Spirit, and if we are to live that powerful, the spiritual life, then we must focus on one thing and one thing only, and that is Jesus Christ. And because he was focused on Jesus, he was able to give 
that powerful message, and a church was born. Now, it's interesting, when you look at the society back then, and you look at the society today, there are actually a lot of similarities. The world was in trouble. There was a rise in evil and demoralization. And after the resurrection, Jesus told his disciples in Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. He told them, don't leave until you have received the power of the Holy Spirit. And here's one of the reasons why I believe he said that, church. And here's why it is so important that we too receive the power of the Holy Spirit. If our society is like theirs, where it's in trouble, we have all this evil. Jesus told them, you can't go out into the world and you can't function without the power of the Holy Spirit. So many times we think of the power of the Holy Spirit as the gifts and the fruit and all this stuff. But what Jesus is saying is, you can't survive in this world without the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't survive without the Spirit giving you wisdom and knowledge, giving you guidance, giving you strength, giving you encouragement. See, church, that's why we need the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why we need to live a Spirit-filled life. So when we go out into the world, that we have enough strength and protection to be able to survive in the world. The Spirit isn't just about the gifts and the fruit. That is a powerful part of it. But the Spirit comes to us to be an, enc an encourager, a, a guide, a protector for us. Church, that's why we need the power of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that's one of the reasons why Jesus said, do not leave until you have received the power of the Holy Spirit. Up to that time, they had Jesus with them. They didn't need the power of the Holy Spirit. They had Jesus, but he's saying, now is when it gets really interesting. And if you're going to do what I'm calling you to do, and if you're going to be effective like I want you to be effective, then do not leave until you have the power of the Holy Spirit. I was talking to a friend of mine who, they're moving um, their, their child from a, a Christian school to a public school. And they were saying, well, what do you think about that? I said, you know, there's really no difference, to be honest with you, between a Christian school and a public school. There's just as much junk in the Christian school as there is in the public school. And so it really doesn't matter where you put your kid. It's what you do with your kid and what you give your kid that's going to make the difference in it. If you, if you preach them the, the Word of God, if you give them that encouragement, if they receive the power of the Holy Spirit, it doesn't matter where you put them. You see, that's the same thing for us. We can't say, well, I'm just going gonna, gonna to work where there's just Christians. I, I'm going to go to school where there's just Christians. I'm going to go to the Starbucks where all the Christians are. No, it's impossible. You work for a Christian company, I guarantee you there's not Christians working there. You go to a Christian school, I promise you there's not Christians going to school there. You walk into the Christian Starbucks, I promise you not everybody in there is Christian. So Jesus says, before you go out into the world, you walk into a church, I promise you all the people in the church aren't Christian. But Jesus is saying, before you go out into the world, make sure you have the power of the Holy Spirit. And if we're going to have that power, church, as Peter is telling us here, we have to focus on one thing and one thing only, and that is Jesus Christ. Nothing more, nothing less than that. And Peter preaches, he says, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited, approved or authenticated by God, like God proved who he was. And Jesus of Nazareth, uh, by God, of his miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. Now, Peter said, it wasn't Jesus doing the miracle. It was God working through Jesus to do the miracles. Now, so many times, and here's the issue. I, I, my last day in 49, I'm going out in fire. I can't stand people that get up and speak. Or say, I watched a guy last night on TV, and they talk about how they do the miracles. It's the power of my holy water that you buy for 29 bucks, and the holy water does everything. This guy's like, man, I, I received the, I received your holy water, and, and I got a check from the IRS for $3,500, and then the next week I got another check from the IRS for $3,500, then they called me and they said, hey, did you cash that second check? He's like, yeah, he's like, well, don't worry about it, it was a mistake, keep it. Really? I don't think the IRS would do that. Or another guy who's like, he received the, 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 the water for 29 bucks, and he goes up and the guy throws his cane. He's like, now go run. He's like, yeah, I got to go get my cane because I still need it. 
See, that drives me nuts when people take it off Jesus Christ. See, we get to be involved in the miracles, but we're not the one doing the miracles. And when we are in spirit, when we're spirit filled, we focus on Jesus Christ. Who did Jesus talk about? It wasn't Jesus, it was his father. Why do we twist it so much? Why do we twist it? So if we're going to live that spirit filled life, and what Peter says here is, Jesus is Jesus because God worked through him. God proved who he was through the signs, miracles, and wonders. And if we are blessed, church, if we are blessed to have the Spirit work through us, it will be God and Jesus that gets the credit, not us. We will just be the people they chose for that particular point in time to receive that blessing. But church, never, never walk around saying, I can heal people. Now, J.D., man, if you are ever sick or ill, you want that woman praying for you because the Spirit works through that woman in mighty and powerful way. But I promise you, J.D. will be the first one to say, it's not her, but it's Jesus Christ. Amen? See, if we are to live a Spirit-filled life and take advantage of all the things that Jesus has in store for us, then we must focus on Jesus and only Jesus. <coughs> And if we are blessed to have the Spirit work through us, then let's be clear, it's done by God and only by God. And that's what Peter says to the crowd here. Those signs, miracles, and wonders were done by God. You saw them. And quite honestly, there's no other way to explain them. When someone is raised from the dead four days after they die, there's no way to explain it. When Jesus can feed five plus thousand people with a couple of fish and loaves of bread and still have enough for take-homes, take leftovers, there's no other way to explain it. And that's what Peter's saying. He's saying there's one thing. Rather than focus on the tongues and the fire and the wind, don't focus on that. Focus on Jesus. And I think one of the greatest examples of this in the Bible is when we get ourselves into trouble, when we take the focus off Jesus or off the Lord, is Moses. God had told Moses, here's what I want you to do. You're going to speak to a rock. Water's going to come out of the rock. And Israel is going to be impressed with what I, God, have done. Well, Moses is like us. Moses got really upset and angry at people, and so... He hit the rock with his rod, and the water came out. And what was God angry about? He said, you made it look like it happened by you. And that wasn't the plan. The plan was for people to see the power from me. And when we get away from God, God says, you made it look like it came from you. In church, it doesn't. Church, we don't have to pay 29 bucks for the, the, the spirit-filled water. Because the Spirit is within us. We don't have to call up a, a, a place and, and give 50 bucks so they'll pray for us. Because God hears our prayers anyway. See, if we are to live a Spirit-filled life, we focus on one thing and one thing only. And that's Jesus Christ. But then Peter pronounces to remind them, in verse 23 he says... This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Now, interesting enough, this reference to cross is the only time in the book of Acts that cross is actually mentioned. There's three other times when it's mentioned about him hanging, but it's always on a tree. But this is the only time that it talked about a cross. He says, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Peter announces, yes, you had your part in all of this. Yes, you helped crucify him. But you had nothing to do with it. This was all a part of God's plan. The plan was set. God knew it before him. He understood the cross, the cost of the cross, and he sent Jesus in it. And then he raised him from the dead. You see, death couldn't kill him because Peter had said, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death. And the tomb, well, quite honestly, the tomb was nothing but a womb which Christ came forth in victory because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. 
Peter told the crowd that day something that they could not fully understand. That what they had just seen and witnessed with Jesus had been completely and fully orchestrated by God. Yes, they were responsible for their own actions, but God was still in control over everything. And see, church, the same things in our life as well. Yes, we are responsible for our own actions. We must deal with the consequences of our own actions. But even when we mess up, God is still in control. He still has a plan. I went to Home Depot yesterday and I was talking to this nice woman, the, the cashier. She said, how's your day? And uh, she said something like, well, have you gotten yourself into trouble yet today? I'm like, ma'am, I was in trouble before I woke up today. But even when we have days like that, church, God is still in control and God still has a plan for us. That's why we must focus on one thing. And that's Jesus Christ. God ultimately triumphed over the evil plot and schemes of the people. The audience that Peter spoke to, they knew that Jesus was a real person from a town in Nazareth. And they had performed many signs and wonders. It was clear that God's hand was on them. They had heard him speak and watched his life. And they had seen him raised from the dead. And even then, they could still find no fault in him. William Barclay, in a book called The Gospel of John, wrote, It is told that in the First World War, there was a young French soldier who was seriously wounded. His arm was so badly smashed that it had to be amputated. He was a magnificent specimen of young manhood, and the surgeon was grieved that he must go through life maimed. So he waited beside his bedside to tell him the bad news when he recovered consciousness. When the lad's eyes opened, the surgeon said to him, I am sorry to tell you, that you have lost your arm. Sir, said the lad, I did not lose it. I gave it for friends. Jesus was not helplessly caught up in a mesh of circumstances from which he could not break free. He did not lose his life. He gave it. The cross was not thrust upon him. He willingly accepted it for us. God raised him from death, freeing him from the agony of death. And when it comes to us living a spirit-filled life, we must focus on one thing, Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's about Jesus in the morning. It's about Jesus in the afternoon. It's about Jesus in the evening. And if we want to live a spirit-filled life, it has to be about Jesus. And as Peter spoke, he was readying the crowd for God's plan. And he said, it says in Ezekiel 11, 19, Then I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within them, and take the stony heart out of their flesh, and give them a heart of flesh. Now remember, Peter earlier, Peter was speaking, uh, the Holy Spirit was speaking through Peter to convict them, to change them, and to teach them about obedience. And that's similar to many sermons that we hear about in today. Well, I hope they're similar to many sermons that we hear about in today's churches, where we talk about how the Word of God convicts us and changes us and brings us to obedience. But unfortunately, many hear the word, but they never get the new spirit within them. And they never take the stony heart out of their flesh. Unfortunately, not everybody that heard that sermon today received the Holy Spirit. And what I think is even sadder today in, in the churches is there are Christians that don't receive and know about the Holy Spirit. Because they're never told about the Holy Spirit. You see, to receive the Holy Spirit, we must be ready for the glory of God's plan. People can read about the Holy Spirit, but some people just can't understand that the Holy Spirit lives inside them. And that's what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 3.16. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit dwells within you? Church, there's no limit to what God can do through you. There's no limit to the amount of what God can give you. And as Peter focuses on Jesus, he reminds them of what David had said to them. In verse 25, I saw the Lord always before me because he is my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead 
You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. What Peter did is he quoted specifically something out of Psalms that King David had written a long time ago. And he did that for a reason, because they knew King David, they respected King David, but honestly, they honored King David. And he said, let me tell you what King David, the man who you respect and love and honor, let me tell you what he said was going to happen. And then he began to describe how Jesus would be raised from the dead. Now Peter said, David's not talking about David. Because you know David's dead. I can show you where his tomb is, and I bet you if we dug it up, we'd find his bones. David's not talking about David. David's talking about Jesus Christ. And he did it so that they could understand and respect what he was saying to them. He said, fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Even though David was dead, even though David was in a tomb, his words still spoke a very powerful message to the people. And here's one thing I always say at services, memorial services or funerals I do. I always say that when I get the call saying that someone's been killed or died or whatever, I don't spend my time writing a sermon. I spend my time reflecting on the life of the person. Because I don't believe that it's my job as a pastor to write a sermon but I believe in a service like that, it's my job to share with you the sermon that the person wrote while they were alive. You might not understand this, but your life, every day, every decision you make, every action you do, is writing your own sermon that will be given at your service. And that's exactly what happened here. David's own words was the sermon that Peter gave that day. Your own words are the sermon that a pastor will give on that day from you. Church, I don't think we realize that. I, I, I think so many times we keep thinking about, well, uh, one day, one day, one day. But every day you write a new chapter and a new version of the sermon that will be given at your service. Will it be a sermon of hope and joy? Will it be a sermon of how the Holy Spirit transformed you and changed you? Will it be a sermon on how you were filled with the Holy Spirit and you went out and did amazing things? Or will it be a sermon of too bad? You see, David, even though he was dead, was speaking to thousands of people that day. In church, long after we are gone, our sermon will speak to people that we don't even know. And Peter reminded him that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. And Peter saying that descendant happens to be Jesus Christ. So Peter said, if you want to receive the Holy Spirit, and you must be ready for the glory of God's plan. And he said in verse 32, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. I hope there's one thing that I've made clear to you so far in this series, that the Holy Spirit is not a silent influence but it is a power. The Holy Spirit is not a thought or a feeling, but it is a person. Peter tells them that they had experienced the Holy Spirit that day, and they didn't believe it, or they didn't happen just because the apostles said so. And it's amazing to me that so many thousands of years after that, there are still people, still good, godly people, that don't believe in the Holy Spirit. The Bama Group had a, a, a survey, and there was an article that said, most American Christians do not believe that Satan or the Holy Spirit exists. And the article said, most Christians do not believe that the Holy Spirit is a living force either. Overall, 38 strongly agree 
and 20 agreed somewhat that the Holy Spirit is a symbol of God's power or presence, but it's not a living entity. Church, that's over half of Christians. And I put the article in your hand up. Half of Christians don't believe that the Holy Spirit is real. Just one third of Christians disagreed that the Holy Spirit is not a living force. 9% disagreed somewhat, 25% disagreed st strongly, while 9% were not sure. Church, why aren't we seeing the things that we saw in Acts chapter 2 in our churches? Because so many people in the churches don't believe the Holy Spirit is real. And I think it's crazy that most American Christians don't believe that Satan or the Holy Spirit exists. Maybe that's why so many Christians are getting themselves in trouble. Not only we don't believe in the Holy Spirit that's there to give God and protect us, but then we don't even believe that Satan's real. So if Satan's not real, then we don't have to be worried about him, right? We don't have to have our guard up. We don't have to watch anything. But then if Satan's not real, then really how on earth can we know that anything's real for that matter? Because if Satan's not real and the Holy Spirit's not real, then are we really sure Jesus is real? And if Jesus isn't real, then hey, maybe that whole Big Bang Theory is making a whole lot more sense now, right? Church, I believe that if we're going to see a revival in this country, and I keep hearing from people, I was at this, this prayer group with churches, uh, pastors this week. They keep talking about the great revival is coming. The great revival is coming. The great revival is coming. Church, I believe if that great revival is coming, then we need to start believing in the Holy Spirit. Because I can tell you this, the great revival ain't coming without it. So if we believe that that great revival is coming, if we believe that that great revival is coming, then we have to believe in the one who's going to cause that great revival to happen. As I said, the great thing, in, in, in uh, the help of the book I'm listening to, there's something better than Jesus. That's Jesus working through the Holy Spirit. If we believe that there's going to be a great revival, then it's got to be Jesus working through the Holy Spirit. And if Jesus is going to work through the Holy Spirit, then He's going to have to work through us. And in order for Him to work through us, church, we have to believe that He is real. We have to believe that it happens. We have to believe that it just doesn't happen in Acts 2. We have to believe that it happens in Journey of Faith 1. We have to believe that when we walk out of here today, that something powerful and mighty can and will happen. We have to believe that at, at any moment in our lives, the Holy Spirit can choose to work through us in a powerful and mighty way. We have to believe that it's not just the person to your left or to your right or the person standing up here. We have to believe that it can happen to us. Church, I hope we get to a point where we just don't believe it, but I hope we get to a point where we expect it. Peter said in verse 36, Therefore let all Israel be assured that God has made this Jesus whom you were crucified, both Lord and Messiah. See, here's the thing I don't understand. When you look at the Bible, and you look at all the things in the Old Testament that came true in the New Testament, and what Paul's, excuse me, what Peter's telling these people here is, you saw what happened. You met the man. You checked out the tomb, and it's vacant. You saw him after he died. And what Peter's telling them is, you just can't argue with the facts. Too many times, too many Christians, and too many and too other people, we get so caught up in arguing with the facts. Well, that just can't, that, that can't be, that doesn't make sense. Yes, the Holy Spirit was alive and well in Acts, but that was then. When we're, when we're in the last days, the Holy Spirit's going to come back. That, the last days are when the Holy Spirit's going to come back. Not now. But church, when you read God's Word, when you study God's Word, when you understand God's Word, you can't argue with the facts. Jesus came. Jesus died. 
Jesus rose, and Jesus won. And if we believe that, which I hope we do, then we have to believe everything else in the Bible. And if you really believe everything else in the Bible, the church, you can't argue with the facts. We don't have a leg to stand upon. This is the one debate, the one argument we will never win. No matter how loud we yell, no matter how often we scream, we will never, ever, ever be able to argue the facts of God's Word. We will never, ever, ever be able to argue the way that the Holy Spirit is working in our area, and in our lives, in our society, in our churches. So church, we, I believe, need to stop arguing the facts, and we need to start rejoicing and giving thanks for the facts. God didn't write the Bible asking for our opinion. I don't know why we as Christians love to give our opinions on God's work. Well, yes, that's what it says, but here's what I really think it believes. Yes, President Jefferson wrote separation of church and state, but here's what he really meant by that. God's not asking for our opinion. He's not asking for our feedback. God's asking for us to believe in Him. And if we truly believe God, and if we truly believe in God's Word, then we can't argue with the facts. The facts are that Jesus came, He died, was buried, and raised again. The facts are that He promised us that the Holy Spirit would be with us, and it is. The facts are that through this Holy Spirit, it brings life, it brings faith, and we begin to see life begin. I believe that there is a revival that could come to this country. But I believe if we're going to see that revival, great you guys are going to come up. I believe that if we're going to see that revival, then we have to see a revival within churches first. I prayed on Thursday night, you know, we were, we were going around the room praying. How many times, how many times do we pray for the non-believers and sinners? I hope. You know who we need to be praying for? We need to be praying for the people in the churches. In the churches. Because I believe the greatest conflict and issues and problems are coming from the people sitting in the pews, not the people sitting in the bars. And if we're going to see revival in this country, and if we're going to see a, a powerful outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and a powerful movement of the Holy Spirit, then church, I believe we need to pray for the people here. Because it's going to be these people that are transformed and changed and inspired and filled that go out and do the powerful works of the Holy Spirit. And when the non-believers see the powerful works of the Holy Spirit, they're going to get it. But if we're praying for the non-believers... Church, we're never going to get to them. Because if we're God's army, and we don't go out and fight the battle, then the battle's never going to be won. So I encourage you right now, pray for this church. Pray for every church. Pray for every Christian you know. Pray for every pastor you know. Pray that their hearts would be right. Pray that they would be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Church, then and only then will we be able to go out and make an impact in the society. So many times we just assume that because we sit in the church that everything's right in our lives. No, we're, we're messed up people. We're all broken people. We all need prayer. We all need to be saved. We all need help. We all need to be filled. But I can tell you, when I was at my lowest and my worst, there was nothing coming out of my mouth that was going to help anybody come to know Jesus. In fact, I, I, I'm ashamed to say I probably pushed some people away from Jesus. Church, it doesn't matter how many outreaches. Greg, Greg, uh, Greg Lloyd just had his big Harvest America yesterday in Dallas. Church, it doesn't matter about any of that stuff if the workers aren't prepared and equipped to go out and do the work. So I encourage you, pray for, pray for every Christian you know. Pray for every church you know. Pray that there would be a movement and a moving inside of them and their church before there's a movement and a moving inside of their community. Because church, I believe that the only way 
we are going to be, we are going to see revival in this country is if we see revival in our churches. You see, I'm convinced that if, if our church is really raised up and, and all of us that call ourselves Christians really raised up, our country wouldn't be so jacked up right now. Can we be real for a minute? They agree too. We allege to be Christians, but as, as rules and laws are passed and things change, we do nothing about it. We allege to be Christians, but for so many of us, we think that the rulings and the laws and the decisions that are made are great. They're great, aren't they? Great, they're great. I believe that if we raised up as one body, this country would be in far, a far different case and position than it is today. So before you pray for the country, and I, we need to pray for our leaders, we need to pray for our country, before you pray for anybody in church, pray for the churches and the Christians. Because we have to be right before we can think about making our society and our country right. Pray for all the moms and dads, because before their family can be right, they have to be right. And I remember I went to a Promise Keepers once, and uh, Tony Evans was speaking. Have you ever heard Tony Evans? Man, that guy's awesome. He was, uh, he, I don't know if he still is, he was the chaplain for the Dallas Cowboys and the Mavericks. And man, after he spoke, I was ready to go play football. But he said this, if you want to make your family right, then you have to make yourself right first. And if you want to make your community right or your neighborhood right, then you have to make sure that your house is right. And if you want to make your city right, then you have to make that your neighborhood's right. And if you want to make your county right, then you have to make sure that your city's right first. And if you want to make your state right, you have to make sure your county right. And if you want to make your country right, you have to, in other words, saying it all comes back to us. Before we can think about or talk about making anybody else better, we need to bring it back to us. We need to be focused on Jesus Christ. We need to believe that the promises in God's Word are true. And they weren't just for the apostles or the crowd that day, they're for us as well. We need to believe that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can not only transform ourselves, but we can see other people transform. We would need to believe that through the power of the Holy Spirit, each and every one of us can make an impact and a difference in this world. It's not up to anybody else but us, church. I can't complain about whoever gets elected if I don't take the time to vote. I can't complain about all the things that are going on in our society if I don't stand up and raise my voice. Just like choices yesterday. Church, there are things happening. I think I shared with you last week, the week before. Last year, more abortion clinics closed than opened. There are people standing up and making a difference. And church, if other people are doing it, then why can't you? This is not a time to be ashamed or afraid or bashful. This is a time to be transformed and changed. Imagine what people thought when Goofball Peter stood up to speak. Like, oh, what's this guy going to say, right? You worry about what are people going to think when I speak? You speak the Word of God and that's all you have to worry about. You proclaim Jesus Christ and that's all they're going to hear. They might not like you personally. They might not like me personally. They might not like what I wear. Some people don't like my tattoos or whatever. The church, nobody can argue with the facts of Jesus Christ. So when we're a spirit-filled church, and when we're spirit-filled people, and we're encountering the spirit, we go out and we proclaim Jesus Christ to everybody. And everybody says, well, in, in the end times, you never hear anything about America. You know, my fear is we don't hear anything about America because the church died. So before we can think about other countries, other places, as Tony Evans said, we need to focus on our home right here. So Lord, we thank you for today, Lord. We thank you for your word, Lord. We, we ask and we pray in the name of Jesus for your spirit to just fall upon us, Heavenly Father. Fill us, empower us, Lord Jesus. Lord, may we go out and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, Heavenly Father, to all that will hear it. 
Lord, may we see revival within Christians and within churches, Heavenly Father. Lord, may we see an uprising of the power of the Holy Spirit within these people. May we see the signs, miracles, and wonders, Heavenly Father. And just as Peter proclaimed and preached to that crowd, Lord, may we go out with confidence and boldness, not in ourselves, but in you. And Lord, I pray for everybody in this room right now, Heavenly Father, wherever they are, whatever they've done, or however they feel. Lord, I pray for your spirit just to rest upon them. I pray for your spirit to encourage them and comfort them. I pray for your spirit to lead them and guide them. Lord, I pray for your spirit to give them the strength and courage to do what they know they must do. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that our lives would continue to be transformed and changed by your power, by your spirit, and by your presence. In Jesus' glorious and awesome and mighty name we pray. Amen. Now as you're ready, as we're doing worship, we have communion today. So when you're ready, I encourage you to come up and receive the bread and the juice. We're going to do communion again on, on Easter Sunday at the end of March. But these are reminders to us that Jesus is gone, but His Spirit is with us. That Jesus is gone, but His power and His presence are still within us. And this bread and this, and this juice reminds us that Jesus overcame death. And because of that, we too have victory in our lives as well. So when you're ready, I encourage you to come up and receive your, uh, your communion. We hope that you've enjoyed today's podcast. Journey of Faith is a Foursquare Christian Church located in Glendora, California. For more information on Journey of Faith, visit us on the internet at www.thejourneyoffaith.net. That's www.thejourneyoffaith.net. You may also call us at 626-914-3400. And finally, we hope you will come visit us. Our Sunday morning service is at 10 a.m. We offer ministries for all ages, from newborns through high school during our service. May God bless you. Thank you for joining the journey.